I'm Lisa Lippincott, and I'm here to talk about the truth of a procedure. But more generally, I'm here because I became interested in this question. Why don't we routinely write down the reasoning behind our programs in a formal way and have computers check our reasoning? Because I think we are very good at writing things down in a formal way. We do that routinely because that's coding. Um, we should know the reasons why we expect our programs to work. Um, so presumably we, we have that stuff ready to write down. When we write things down for coding, we write them down in a formal way. And it would be super valuable to have computers check our reasoning to tell us when the reasoning is wrong. And computers checking things, computers checking things is easy. We do that all the time too. But we don't routinely put all of this together. Occasionally people do. In really expensive software, people put all of this together. Um, but it, but even for simple things, we don't routinely do this. And I think the answer to this question um, is this. The mathematical tools we use for proofs present a poor user interface for programming. They fight the programming, and, and so it's hard to use both at once. And that's especially true of procedural programming, which is dependent on notions of time and change. So my goal is to come up with mathematical tools that work better for procedural programming. And that leads me to my home field of mathematics, some people here thought it was topology. It's not. <laughs> it's logic. That's what I have my degree on. Log uh, in logic is the field of mathematics that talks about what it means to write something down formally, what it means for a sentence to be true or false, for one sentence to imply another, what it means to prove something. All of that is the domain of logic. And today, I'm going to be talking about what I call procedural logic. That is, logic formulated as, an, as a way of arranging events, of things that you can check and say in time and space, as opposed to logic that happens in some platonic universe. And I believe that procedural logic fits better into procedural programs. The central tenet, the central metaphor of procedural logic is this. Procedures are sentences. That's pretty dense. I will expand. By a procedure, I mean an embodied algorithm conceived as a scheme for arranging events in time, space, possibility, and causality. I mean what we mean in C++ by the word function. But what I don't mean by a procedure is what mathematicians mean by the word function. I don't mean a mapping of input to output. I mean a scheme for arranging events. Now, a scheme for arranging events can implement a mapping from input to output. That's fine. But I'm interested in the events. Sentence, on the other hand, I mean in the logician sense. A sentence is a statement about the world, which can either be in agreement with the world, that is to say true, or in disagreement with the world, that is to say false. Um, you might wonder why we would care whether a procedure we write. Yes? Sorry, are you, are you using model theory here or just abstract logic? Uh, this uh, oh, the question is, am I using model theory or abstract logic? 
I am going to class model theory as a part of abstract logic. <laughs> um, so, um, and yes, this is vaguely Tarski-ish. It's less than vaguely. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, might wonder whether we why we care whether our procedures are true or false in the logician sense. And the reason we care is that if our procedure disagrees with the world, in particular if it disagrees with the computer it's running on, on how events may be arranged, the world is going to win. If the, if events can't be arranged the way our procedure says events can be arranged, then things will not work the way our procedure says. It will have some other behavior. That's what we call undefined behavior. We have this out for our implementations. If the procedure is written wrong, anything can happen. <laughs> um, so. That's why we care. We want to avoid undefined behavior. We want to write procedures that are in agreement with the world. Um, so, sentences. Um, here is an example of a sentence. This is a boring sentence that tells us essentially nothing about the world. Don't worry too much about that. But you can see that it is either true or false. You're pretty used to this sort of sentence, and you're probably used to thinking of this sort of sentence as a tree where there's an algorithm for coloring in the nodes of the tree from leaves to root, leaving you with a color for the root that tells you whether the sentence is true or false. And that's a fine way to look at a sentence, a very algebraic way, but it's not the way I'm going to follow today. Um, I'm going to follow a way that is more common with logicians these days. Um, perhaps a little more trendy, I don't know. Um, I'm going to turn the tree upside down and play a game. And this game is played between two players. Traditionally, they are called player one and player two. Or, if you're really mean, you call them player I and player I-I. <laughs> um, I can never remember which one is player one and which one is player two. So I'm going to call them the bald guy and the guy with the horns. And that way I'll be able to keep them straight. I've colored the nodes in the tree according to whose turn it is. So, at, the, at an or node, the, the bald guy chooses which branch to take. At an and node, the guy with the horns chooses which branch to take. Um, at a true node, it's, I gave the true node to the guy with the horns because this is the sort of game that you can only lose if it's your turn. When it's not your turn, you're safe in this game. So I've given the, the true node to the guy with the horns, but he has nothing to choose. He loses as soon as if he's forced to choose at a true node. Likewise, the bald guy cannot make a choice if he's at a false node, so he loses. And that's how this game is played. Now, either player could win this game. There's a, there are paths for uh, where either player wins. But the bald guy has an advantage. The bald guy can throw away some of his moves. Not some of the other players' moves, but he just throws away some of his moves. Leaving a game where he cannot lose. That's a winning strategy. So here I'm going to say the sentence is true because the bald guy has a winning strategy. Those two things mean the same thing. Um, you might wonder how not fits into this. It's very easy to describe and and or and true and false as a game. Not nodes would be more difficult. So not, they fit into the algebraic view of things. They don't fit very well into this view. So instead, I'm going to say that not is a transformation on the game. Not 
is flipping every, every node over to the other player. And that means that if one player has a winning strategy in the game, the other player has a winning strategy in the negation of the game. And this is what false means. False means the guy with the horns has a winning strategy. Um, so I think that's about enough for sentences as games. Quick questions there? Nope. Um, then I will move on to code. But first, a warning. The code here is written in a fantasy C++ with extensions that make proofs fit into the code. This doesn't work on your compiler at home yet. So C++ 23? <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking it might take more than 23, but I'm hoping for 29. <laughs> um, so let's see what the play field for our game is. Here's the playing field. We have a function foo, and center court for our game is the implementation of this function foo. Off to the left, yes, your left, um, we have the interface for foo. Off to the right, we have the interfaces of things called by foo. I didn't draw them in, but interfaces of things called from the interfaces also are part of the game. But implementations of things that get called apart from foo itself are not part of the game. That's off the field. Um, so the game here is played entirely in a single translation unit. Um, our path through the game is we start with the interface we, we start at the beginning of the interface to foo, go through its prologue. When we hit the implementation statement, we enter the implementation. Anytime there's a call, we go to the prologue of that call. When we hit the implementation statement, something happens off field that we don't see, and we return through the epilogue of that call. Eventually, we hope to return to the epilogue of foo, and at that point, we reach the end of our field. Um, we're going to divide this path into turns for the two players. So here, the guy with the horns takes us through the prologue of the interface of Foo, but as soon as we reach center field, bald guy takes over and it's his turn. It remains the bald guy's turn until we manage to leave the field through some inter through you know after the prologue of some interface, at which point the guy with the horns takes over, bringing us back to the center field. Again, when we enter center field, the bald guy takes over. Center court is the right metaphor there. Um, <laughs> uh, bald guy it, it continues. Even if we exit the implementation, the bald guy's turn continues all the way through the epilogue, at which point the guy with the horns gets a turn that he is not very happy about. Um, so you can think of this as a sequence of turns, but it's even better to think of it as a set of nested turns. It's best to think of the guy with the horns ha having one big exterior turn and every execution of the implementation as being a turn for the bald guy, which is interrupted by little turns for the guy with the horns any time play leaves the field through something called. So here we have nesting of turns instead of have instead of a sequence of turns. And it is important that the turns only be nested a finite depth. That's not too hard because we can see one, two, three. Three is finite. <laughs> yes. So, um, let's just say I don't understand exactly where you're going with this, but 
<coughs> why is there uh, asymmetry between the turns of the guy with the horns? Why is he not also uh, his? Why, why is the epilogue mm. of the external part not part okay. of the horns? Okay, so the the question is why is there asymmetry in this between how the bald guy plays and the guy with the horns plays? Um, it, the the symmetry here is between inward and outward. The guy with the horns plays inward, the bald guy plays outward, and we will see why that's important later. Um, anything else? Um, so once we have figured out this nesting of turns, once we look at this as nesting of turns, we know what to do if the game goes on forever. We're going to assess a penalty to the player whose turn goes on forever. If we get stuck in a loop in the epilogue of some called function, we assess the penalty to the guy with the horns, he loses. If we get stuck in a loop in the implementation, we assess the penalty to the bald guy and he loses. If we get stuck in a loop where the, the implementation keeps calling things and they keep returning forever, we assess the penalty to the bald guy because the guy with the horns ended all of his turns, whereas the bald guy had one big turn that never ended. And of course, if we get stuck in a loop out there in the prologue, then the penalty goes to the guy with the horns. The bald guy never even got a turn in that case. So that's the delay of game rule. We assess the penalty to the player whose turn went on forever. Um, before moving on, I'm going to I, I want to drop to a more concrete example. And, of course, traditional concrete example for programming is always the factorial function. Um, here I've written an interface for the factorial function that has some new things that aren't in C++, so I will explain them. Um, claim is a kind of assertion, but it's a special sort of assertion that needs to be true for local reasons. It's not true because of something in your head. It's not true because of something outside the program. It's not even true for something that's far away in the program. It's true for something that is nearby. But true for something that is nearby and before. For some reason that is nearby and comes before. So the purple claims here are, need to be true for reasons that are in other functions, for reasons that are outside our game. The yellow claims need to be true for reasons that are inside our game. So I'm going to give the yellow claims the, to the bald guy and the purple claims to the guy with the horns. And that actually matches up very nicely with whose turn it is. Um, if a claim statement fails, our rule is the current player loses. We also have this thing usable that I keep claiming. Um, it's not your usual sort of assertion. We're used to assertions about R values, that some R value is true. Usable is an assertion about an L value. Um, and I, it's the one, it's one that is super useful and very flexible in an object-oriented sort of way. Um, I'm going to say, that an L value is usable if it may be used in the usual manner for its CV qualified type. And I'm going to be talking about a, a lot about ints today, which are scalar L values. And here are the rules. Usable scalar values have a stable value, usable scalar L values have a stable value if they're not volatile and are modifiable if they're not const. Um, but keep in mind it's an assertion about the L value, not about the object it refers to. Um, class types, 
get to have complicated usability. So for example, a vector can have usability that involves being able to get at a whole lot of elements and rearrange them and delete them and you know, erase them, whatever. Um, but today, ints. Um, so let's begin playing. As we play the game, every time we come to any sort of thing that is implemented outside our function, we're going to head off to its interface. So the first thing we do here is we compare n to 0, and we need to go to the interface for greater than or equals. And as we play the interface for greater than or equals, which I will mention is abbreviated for the talk, I think there are more things, particularly in the post conditions, that it should say, but I'm just going to show the parts that we need. Um, so here, coming in for greater than, you need two usable ints coming in. And every time we claim that a non that a non-volatile L value is usable, um, we're going to have the current player announce the value. And that makes the game more entertaining for the spectators and helps the judges see how the game is being played. Um, so here, guy with the horns, whose turn it is, is announcing that A is 6 and B is 0. We come to the implementation and we skip over it because that's what we do with implementations. And we, um, the, the guy with the horns claims that A is 6, B is 0, result is true, um, but there is a rule he is constrained by. Um, because there was no talk in this interface about changing the value of A or B, he is required to use the same value on the way out here. So unexpectedly changing a value is penalized. With that, we can return to the interface of factorial. And here we are. Um, we have another claim of usability. There's, you know, you, you might think we've claimed it twice already. Why are we claiming it again? This claim is important because it tells us that this usability, this value, is important information for how factorial is going to run. It is direct input to factorial, this value 6. Um, of course, if there's direct input, there has to be direct, there has to be a, something that I'm excluding, indirect input. What's indirect input? Uh, it's the address of n. It's whether n is stored in the cache or main memory or on disk or off over a network someplace. And maybe you have, maybe you need credentials for the network or some encryption key. All of that stuff, which is included in the usability of n, is not important to this function. It's getting carried along. We need it, but the values aren't important. The value 6 is important. So with that, we can finally get to our implementation. And here we go. Factorial implementation, I've tried to write it carefully. This honestly isn't the best factorial implementation I think I'm careful of, but I think it's good pedagogically. Um, you will notice I even check to see if I'm doing overflow so that I won't get into undefined behavior here. Um, it is fairly dense to walk through code this way. So I'm going to give you a moment to grok the function as it is, and then I'm going to explode it. Here's a graph of how we're going to run the function. <laughs> Uh, we start by initializing an integer. How do we initialize an integer? We use some external operation, a construction for that integer. So here's an interface for how we construct an integer. We need a usable value to construct it from, copy constructing. Um, 
And so the bald guy announces the value on our way in. He says, this value is one. Um, we hit the implementation. Turn, the turn turns over to the guy with the horns. And we have this new sort of um, assertion, substitutable. Uh, substitutable is a special, very low level assertion that says one value can't be used in place of the other value. That they both effectively have the same value. Uh, you might wonder, why do I not say equal here? Substitutable is a lower level thing than equal. And in particular, it's not something that can be negated. We can talk about inequality. We can test inequality. Substitutable can't have a bang in front of it. We never speak of non-substitutability. It's just something we can assert. So here, we claim, there is a claim of substitutability. The current player has to say that the values are the same, and they have to be the same. Um, and then we have our walk out through these claims of usability. You will notice star this, in this case, is a non-const usability. A, const usability, star this, non-const usability. So the guy with the horns mentions star this can be changed. Moving on, we have another initialization of an integer. That's fairly boring. Um, so I will go straight to this test. I is not equal to zero. For that, we need to go to operator bang equals. And here we are, and whoosh, we are straight out to operator equals because if we see an inline function that isn't separated into an interface and an implementation, we're just going to say that the current player plays through. And that lets us write little functions that tie things together without having to, need, without having to write complex interfaces. Um, there's a danger in doing that. Some people ask me, why not treat every function as an inline function and analyze the entire program this way? And you can try to do that, and it works. It, it can work for small programs, but it doesn't scale well. And every time anything changes, you have to repeat the analysis of the entire program that way. So any change could make the program break. Interfaces give us a little slippage room there and let us do the analysis on a translation unit by translation unit uh, uh, manner. And that way we don't have to repeat the, the analysis for the parts, for the translations units whose dependencies haven't changed. Um, here, I feel confident using this formulation for bang equals um, because I am really confident as a member of the standards committee that we are not going to change the relationship between equal and bang equal. This I think we are committed to for a long time, <laughs> at least for int. It is now completely irrevocable <laughs> that we have this rewriting rule in the language. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so let's go to the definition of the interface for double equal. Um, here, the prologue, fairly familiar, A is 6, B is 0, we hit the implementation, we come out, and there's a branch. I'm going to say that branches that happen in interfaces are also part of the direct input or output, depending on what side they fall on. And that really helps us because it means that if we know the direct input or direct output, we know what claim statements we ran through. So having the branches be part of the direct input or output really solidifies our knowledge of what's going on. They matter. Um, other than that, um, fairly straightforward, we have avoided this claim of substitutability. 
Um, and we return out through bang equals and through not. And that's not very interesting. We will go back to our implementation. Here we come to can multiply. Let's head off to its interface. Um, here, very simple interface. Usable in, usable out. There's nothing more to this. Again, I'm abbreviating a little for um, the talk, but this is all that we're going to be using from it. And um, we announce one, one and six, still one, still six, result is true, we're done. Question? Yes? Maybe you saw this earlier. The result of can multiply could, in theory, be uh, false if you have a very small control system. Who gets to decide the result, or does no one get to decide that result because it's outside the scope of the game? Um, because they're commensurate, so someone could choose it. I'm going to put off that question, and you can ask me later if you don't have an answer. The, the question is, who gets to decide whether can multiply is true or false? Um, and it is a good question. Um, but in this case, we have the guy with the horns announcing can multiply has returned true. Um, we return to our function. Finally, we are ready to multiply some numbers, and we head off to star equals. Or we would if the first thing in the interface of star equals wasn't another call to can multiply, because of course can multiply is the precondition for star equals, a precondition for star equals. So we're back to can multiply. And that lets me talk about one of the other rules of the game. Um, if the function's direct input is repeated, the direct output must also be repeated. This is the consistency rule. So here, um, the bald guy is repeating 1 and 6 for the direct input, and the guy with the horns is going to get penalized if he doesn't give true as the result. Because last time he said true. So that's our rule of consistency. If the direct input is repeated, the direct output will be repeated. And this does give you control when writing your interfaces. You can adjust your notion of direct input and direct output by writing things carefully to be the things you care about being repeatable. Um, this is the only place where the notion of direct input or direct output impacts things. Um, with that, we can return to the interface of star equals. Um, we come through. Um, there's one new claim here, which is aliased. Um, here, two L values are aliased if they refer to the same object. And in this case, it's a, there's a weird sort of rule that goes along with it down at the bottom of the slide. There's a penalty for not mentioning aliasing, for not going through a claim of aliasing if, in fact, the things are aliased and it matters. Um, I won't talk, about, talk much about that rule, but that it's an important rule to have. <laughs> um, and then we can come back. We've multiplied. Are we done with our loop yet? No. We have to decrement our loop variable i. I'll play that very quickly. Here is the um, interface for operator minus minus. It has a precondition, can decrement. There are some numbers, well, one number that can't be decremented. Um, and in this case, um, guy with horns has announced that um, that this number can be decremented because it's six, um, and we come through a bit of aliasing. I've thrown in a claim that we won't actually be making use of. Can increment here, but you can always increment the result of a decrement. Um, uh, and guy with the horns announces the new value. 
in two different places, and notes that they can change because it's a claim of non-const usability. Ah, and with that, we can run around our loop a few times and eventually, let's hope, get to the return statement. When we get to the return statement, are we done? No. When we get to the return statement, we return to the interface and the bald guy plays through the epilogue. But the epilogue is fairly simple. We know all this stuff by now. He announces n is still 6. The result is 720. No penalties there. Um, and are we done? No. Guy with the horns gets his last turn. But in a little surprise, we allow the guy with the horns to call for rematches. And the guy with the horns can call for as many rematches as you want. Your function can get called over and over and over. There is a rule. If the guy with the horns repeats the same direct input, the bald guy is required to repeat the same direct output. This is how that rule affects the bald guy. Um, there is also, of course, a delay of game rule. If the guy with the horns calls for endless rematches, the guy with the horns will lose. Um, that's our game. I call that the game of truth. And if you look carefully in the game of truth, the guy with the horns announces all the input and the bald guy announces all the output in a very broad sense. We don't usually think of, say, multiplication as an operation that involves input and output, but really it is. We have some resources that are in use by our procedure that hold the numbers that we're going to be multiplying, and we hand off those resources to a multiplication unit in the processor. That multiplication unit does its thing and hands back resources that, in, uh, that tell us what the, the, it hands back the resources we gave it and resources that tell us what the uh, product of the two numbers is. Multiplication in this scheme involves input and output. And here, the bald guy is announcing which numbers we multiply, and the guy with the horns is announcing what the product is and returning the storage to us. Um, in this game, there are five penalty conditions that I've talked about, one that I have not talked about and I'm not going to talk about very much, um, we've talked about being stuck in a loop. We've talked about failing an assertion. We've talked about an unexpected change in value. We've talked about inconsistent function results. And we've talked about a little bit about unmentioned aliasing. There is at least one other rule. Um, and there's a rule about having capabilities left over at the end of the function, which you don't pass out through your interface. There's a conservation rule about capabilities. But that's another lecture in particular. Um, it's my lecture, um, Locally Atomic Capabilities and How We Count Them. And hopefully, it's a lecture in the future where I do a better job of that. Um, so the bald guy wins the game of truth if the first penalty goes to the guy with the horns, vice versa. The guy with the horns wins the game of truth if the first penalty goes to the bald guy. That's straightforward. And we can see that the bald guy has a winning strategy if the first penalty goes to the guy with the horns for any input values, because, or sorry, for all input values. Whereas the guy with the horns has a winning strategy if the first penalty goes to the bald guy for some input values. And that's because we put the guy with the horns in charge of the input in that broad sense. So I'm hoping this answers your question, but you can raise it later if, if um, it hasn't. This, a, the, this uh, or not your question, the, the question about the asymmetry here. It's an asymmetry between input and output. And in fact, there is a dual statement about output values which is much less interesting 
unless maybe you're standing outside the function and you reverse what direction time is going and turn the universe inside out, in which case the outside has become the inside and you are now saying something interesting. And your name died, so. <laughs> um, so, bringing it all together, title of the talk, the procedure is true if the bald guy has a winning strategy for this game. The procedure is false if the guy with the horns has a winning strategy. And I'm hoping you can see how that relates to undefined behavior at this point. Failing your claims, getting stuck in a loop, all of those things um, are things that you should not be doing in your program. Um, but you might not see why it is necessary that one player or the other have a winning strategy. That was kind of obvious for the tree case. Uh, it requires a little bit of proof, but it's trickier for this with the delay of game penalties and all. Um, this question, is there always a winning strategy for some player, or could a procedure neither be true nor false? And the answer comes from a theorem back in the 70s. Uh, these games are t have a topological property called Borel, um, named for Emile Borel, one of the founders of game theory. Um, in a Borel game, if one player does not have a winning strategy, the other player certainly does. And Borel did not prove this theorem. Donald Martin proved this theorem, I think, well after Borel was dead. Um, and he did a good job of naming his paper because this is still known as the Borel Determinacy Paper, or the Borel Determinacy Theorem. Now, a theorem like this can lead you to think of the world as having a neat split between sentences that are true and sentences that are false. And that's actually a good way to look at the world, or at least the world of mathematics in some fields. Um, um, Euclidean geometry has a neat split between sentences that are true and sentences that are false. Algebraically closed field of any characteristic um, have a neat split between the true and the false. Um, dense linear orderings with or without endpoints um, have a split between true and false. But these parentheticals here are tricky. Uh, the characteristic of an algebraically closed field is basically telling you what uint max is for your system. And you have this question, well, if I add 15 plus 1, is that going to give me 0 or not? You know, so 15 plus 1 equals 0, that's a statement you can make. 15 plus 1 not equals 0, that's a statement, you, that's a sentence. Um, different algebraically closed fields will have different values for that. We'll, have, we'll call those true or false. There are both kinds. Um, likewise, dense linear orderings. Some of them have a first point, some of them have a last point, some have both, some have neither. Um, and the statement, there is a first point, is true in some dense linear orders and is false in other dense linear orders. So there's four kinds of dense linear orders. The picture for them really looks more like this. There are four kinds of dense linear orders, and each one has a different line between the true and the false. Now, we know what this is in, from, as a, from a programming point of view. This is implementation dependence. Um, it depends what sort of dense linear order you're in. You know, which things are true depends on what sort of dense linear order you're in. And there are a couple of ways to deal with it. One is, if, it, if, the, if it's, this is implementation defined, we look it up in the documentation, find out which case we're in, and write something that is true for that case. 
But that's kind of inconvenient. Nobody likes to read documentation. Um, and often it's easier or just more useful to write portable code. And when we write portable code, we form the different possibilities into an ensemble. And once we have formed an ensemble of these different possibilities, we see that there isn't so much a neat division between the true and the false, so much as a three-way division between the necessary, the merely possible, and the impossible. The necessary are things that are true for every implementation. The, poss the merely possible are things that are true for some implementations and not others. And the impossible are the things that are not true for any implementation. And we're actually kind of stuck with this view um, because those undecidable halting problem programs are here in the possible. Um, and they're in, they are in this middle section in a fairly deep sense. Um, we could, in the standard for instance, um, require that implementers tell us which ones of these are going to halt. Um, but that would require an infinite amount of documentation. Nobody wants to write an infinite amount of documentation because nobody is going to read it anyway. So instead, we're stuck with needing to write portable programs. So as engineers, we just say that good procedures are the necessary procedures. It's not good enough to just be true for a particular system. We want to write necessary procedures. The possible, the merely possible, those are bad. The impossible, also bad. Don't write those. So to go with this, I'm going to explain a second game. Um, and in this second game, we are going to give the, not only the impossible, but also the merely possible to the guy with the horns. He gets a big advantage. So here we go. Is there some advantage we can give to the guy with the horns so that the bald guy has a winning strategy only if the procedure is necessarily true. And there is. We're going to put the guy with the horns in charge of the world, in charge of the computer, in charge of everything that is outside our procedure. So this was your question. In this game, the guy with the horns gets to make a lot of choices. Um, Uh, okay, I will break into math for a minute. The, um, the bald guy represents the existential quantifier. The guy with the horns represents the universal quantifier. Because the guy with the horns is outside and the bald guy is inside. Yes? Stack overflow. Like, how do we show that there is no stack overflow? Ah, okay. Um, this talk is about local reasoning. Um, stack overflow outside, uh, stack overflow that runs through implementation calls is non local reasoning. That's another talk. Maybe it's next year's talk. I've been thinking about that one. But that requires non local reasoning. Only a little bit, though. Um, okay. So for now, just think of Stack Overflow as not being solved by this. <laughs> um, so um, we are going to put the guy with the horns in charge of the computer. Oh, were there any more questions on this? We're going to play the game of necessity. I won't go through every step of the game of necessity because that would be boring. Um, instead, I'm just going to show you the rules that have changed for the two players. Um, Instead of choosing a value when we come to a claim of usability, the guy with the horns instead is just going to name the value. So here, 
uh, we're coming into greater than or equal. This is the first claim of usability in our game, claims of usability in our game. And the guy with the horns announces that the values of the num of those variables are named Sue and Zachary. Um, but there is a rule constraining this. Like before, if there hasn't been an announcement that the values might change, the guy with the horns is required to announce the same names. Um, we, and here we've come down to, uh, with the usability of the result, comparing Sue with Zachary gives us Bob the Boolean. Now, Bob the Boolean is not super useful when we get to a branch. So we have a new rule. When we have a branch or a Boolean claim, um, the guy with the horns has to announce which way that particular Boolean turns. So here, Bob is a left-turning Boolean, so the claim, uh, the claim succeeds. Left-turning uh, Booleans make claims succeed, right-turning Booleans make them fail. Um, but we do have a rule limiting the guy with horns again. He has to be consistent. A Boolean that turns left always turns left. A Boolean that's right always turns right. So here, decisions go into the guy with the horns. Um, when we come to substitutability, we make that really easy for the guy with the horns, too. All he has to do is come up with some excuse for those two names to refer to the same value, such as Fred is Sam's middle name. Um, and at that point, he gets through the claim of substitutability pretty much for free. Again, there is a danger involved. He can't make a left-turning Boolean and a right-turning Boolean be the same. So if you have two Booleans that are turning in different directions, he can still lose on a claim of substitutability. Um, and those are the new rules for the guy with the horns. They are pretty easy. Bald guy, oh, yes. If, if A and B are substitutable, is it necessary to say usable A or B? Can you just say A or B? Because they're substitutable? Ah, um, no. Substitu uh, so substitutability is about value, about, uh, um, oh, the question is, um, since A and B are substitutable, can you say, could I just say one is usable without saying the other is useful? Remember, usable is an assertion about the L value, and A and B remain different L values here. Um, so that's the new easy rules for the guy with the horns. The bald guy gets new hard rules. Uh, first, instead of announcing a value, the bald guy repeats the name used by the guy with horns. Usually, that's pretty easy, but if the guy with the horns hasn't given the value a name yet, the bald guy just loses. If the bald guy is the first one to say some L value is usable, he loses. Um, at branches and Boolean claims, the bald guy doesn't get to make any choice. The guy with the horns makes the choice anyway. So we ask the guy with the horns, he makes the choice, and if it was a Boolean claim, the guy with the horns may have the option of just making the bald guy lose at this point. Not, however, if, he is all, if the guy with the horns has already decided that that's a left-turning Boolean, he can't switch, the uh, switch it now. But, um, if he hasn't decided yet, he can just say, ah, that turns right, claim fails. Um, similarly, substitutability. If the bald guy can repeat reasoning that the guy with the horns has already given for why those two names mean that, uh, refer to the same value, then he can get past a claim of substitutability. But, any novel claim of substitutability is going to make the bald guy lose. So we see the bald guy has 
has essentially no choice here. Not choosing at branches. Um, he is just repeating names. He's just repeating substitutability. Um, and he just has to go with whatever the guy with the horns has given him. So in this game, which I call the game of necessity, um, the guy with the horns is telling a story and the bald guy is telling us how the procedure executes within the confines of that story. And that's very powerful for the guy with the horns and very limiting for the bald guy. And we have all of our old rules have some equivalent in this game adjusted for naming things instead of having values. And there are these two new rules. The guy with the horns isn't allowed to make the branches inconsistent. And the bald guy can't make any novel claim. I mean, if there's a claim that's made up of existing things as parts, he can claim that's fine. But any atomic claim, anything that can't be broken down to parts that are already on the table, he's going to lose. Um, and there's a theorem associated with this. Um, the bald guy has a winning strategy for the game of necessity if the procedure is true for all possible computers. And that's fairly straightforward because a possible computer is a lot like a story about a computer. So if the bald guy can beat every story, he can win on any computer. This, the, the other side is more difficult. The guy with the horns has a winning strategy for this game if the procedure is false for some possible computers. For some possible computer. And that requires us to have some way to talk about what computers are possible and which ones are not. But there is a really nifty technique called forcing, which Paul Cohen invented in the 60s, that helps us find possibilities that are on the edge of necessity. Um, and he used this to prove the independence of the axiom of choice and the continuum hypothesis. But it's also used in, in this situation to find possible execution paths that happen on some computers and not others. Um, so forcing cool math technique, but pretty advanced. Um, what happens? Yes. Uh, um, what happens if we play our game of necessity with our program? Well, I don't know if any of you spotted it, but there is a spot in our program where the bald guy made a novel claim. This is the first claim of can decrement in our program. Our program loses the game of, or the, or the bald guy loses the game of necessity if the guy with the horns plays right here. And it's not even very hard for the guy with the horns to do this. He comes to that novel claim and says, oh, that's a right turn. <laughs> um, so clearly, the game of necessity doesn't quite capture what we wanted, because that was a pretty good program, I think. Um, I wouldn't expect to run that program in a world where there is some number that is greater than zero, but can't be decremented. We need some way to limit the sort of story that the, that the guy with the horns can, uh, can tell us. So we're going to make a new game. Um, and in this game, we will give the bald guy an advantage. And it has to be an advantage that is so strong that it can defeat the guy with the horns, even though he's in charge of the computer and really the entire outside world. Um, and the advantage we're going to give him is the one thing that can defeat that, which is we're going to team up with the bald guy to write the procedure. 
instead of picking some procedure out of the gutter and running it, we are going to intentionally write a procedure that the bald guy can win in the game of necessity. And what we're going to do is as we play the procedure, we're just going to ask him what things to add in. So there's just one new rule here. The new rule is that any time during the implementation, the bald guy can insert claim statements to help direct the logic. And in particular, the bald guy is allowed to make calls to theorems, which are a kind of claim statement that has an interface and an implementation. And these theorems act as rules about the world that limit the guy with the horns. So here, the bald guy suggests that we insert a call to the countdown theorem um, with these parameters. And the countdown theorem's interface looks something like this. It uses claim implementation. Its, its implementation is, a, is, in effect, a single assertion. And that assertion somehow links this idea of greater than or equal to this other idea of being able to count downward to zero, or count downward from high to low. Um, this is, of course, an important property of mathematics. So there's some math going on in the implementation, but that's off field for us. We don't really care about that for our game. All we care is that there is this theorem that gets us across that gap. And the way we play it is very much like before. Um, happily, the bald guy has explained what happened during high greater than or equal to low, so we don't have to head off there. Um, and um, here, um, the guy with the horns, because we have already claimed high greater than or equal to low on his turn, is going to be stuck saying, this is a left-turning Boolean. We make it to the implementation. And in the end, um, the guy with the horns is forced to take us through this loop, naming Sue, Frank, Faye, Ted, Terry, Ollie, and ending with Zachary. And all of those, except the last one, he has to decrement in order to move through the loop. So what we've done is moved the first claim of decrementability from the bald guy's turn to the turn of the guy with the horns by calling this theorem. Um, so in this game of proof, the guy with the horns is telling us a story, while the bald guy gets to ask questions in the story that force the guy with the horns to expand on the story, that force him to obey the rules that the theorems lay out. So here, we're letting the bald guy insert suggestions for what we should write into our program. And of course, delay of game rule, if the bald guy inserts suggestions forever, then he loses. Um, so, the bald guy has a winning strategy for this game of proof. If the procedure can be made necessary by adding claims to the implementation. Now, that's not trivial. You know, it seems like, okay, he's suggesting things. But the hard part is showing that some finite collection of his suggestions are enough. That turns out to be a topological property called compactness. So here, um, there is some way to choose just a finite number of the bald guy's assertion, uh, bald guy's suggestions, incorporate them into the program, and suddenly we have a program where the bald guy can win, can has a winning strategy for the game of necessity. Um, like I said, not quite trivial, 
but not as hard as the theorem about the guy with the horns here. The theorem with the guy with the horns has a winning strategy for the game of proof if the procedure is false for some possible computer that obeys every theorem every time. So in this case, this only happens if the theorems don't guarantee enough to make the program work. So in this case, we want the guy with the horns to win because that's a bad program. Um, this one involved more forces. Ah, yes. So this is basically saying the bald guy can't claim independent thing. The bald is in uh, without the parallel lines axiom, you can claim that the lines never meet, and that's an independent claim that the bald guy can't claim because the horn guy can say, well, we're in a non-Euclidean geometry, you lose. Um, it is it is rather like that. If if there is a theorem, an axiom counts as a theorem. It's just one where the proof is much further away, or maybe even assumed. Um, but theorems and axioms work very similarly when you play them. Um, the if there's a if there is a theorem or axiom that says parallel lines don't converge. The bald guy is able to play that and keep the parallel and keep the story with parallel lines that don't converge. But if that's not a theorem, if that's not in our system, then the bald guy can't play that theorem. And so the guy with horns is able to tell a story of non-Euclidean geometry. Um, okay, I want to say forcing filtered co-limits to make a sort of coherent laser forcing ending with a finite injury argument. Um, I will say that the um, nomenclature in mathematical logic is sometimes quite violent. My thesis had an infinite injury argument in it. Um, and this is modern stuff. I mean, you know, forcing is um, is 1960s, co-limits are category theory from the 70s. So it's pretty modern stuff, but really this is an old idea. The first version of a theorem like this was Gödel's completeness theorem, which he proved in his thesis in 1929. Um, at the time, this did not make a big splash. No one was at all surprised everybody expected this sort of thing to be true. The only reason it seems a little more surprising now is that sometime later, Gödel proved the incompleteness theorem. And the incompleteness theorem was surprising and everybody heard about it and it's famous. And now everybody knows about incompleteness and completeness is kind of in the background. People are sometimes surprised by completeness. You think, well, given incompleteness, there must be a catch somewhere. And there is. Um, the catch comes from this compactness argument. The compactness argument doesn't tell you which claims to insert into the program. It doesn't tell you the reasons why the program has to work. Um, but, as engineers, we know where to find the reasons why our program should work. You know, if you're ever looking for the reasons why your procedure should work, you don't have to look any further than inside your own head. Because if they're not there, you never should have written that procedure in the first place. So, all you have to do is figure out what your reasons are, write down claims and theorems that lay out those reasons, and then you get a, a program that satisfies, where, where the, the bald guy has a winning strategy for the game of necessity. And a program where the bald guy has a straightforward strategy 
for the game of necessity is a proof. This is a proof. I told you there would be tools that make proofs fit into procedural programs. Here it is. <laughs> um, there's a little bit more. The proof does include all the interfaces that are being called from here, so I can't fit it all onto the screen. But this really is it. This is what you write. And if you walk through this program, realizing that the branches are the places where your proof breaks into cases, and the loops that happen on the turn of the guy with the horns are where you break into an induction, and just follow that through, if that works straightforwardly, which it does for this, and okay, I'm waving my hands a little bit with the word straightforwardly, but if it does, then you have a proof. Um, and that's why I call this the game of proof. When you play the game of proof, the bald guy tells you how to turn your program into a proof. Um, I do have one more note. It is awkward that we have to put in a theorem like this to make a logical jump from being greater than or equal to being able to count downward. But really, the reason we needed this theorem came from that statement. I said the precondition for factorial was being greater than or equal to zero. But in fact, the precondition that we used was not that. The precondition we used was that we can count down to zero. So if I just change that precondition, don't have to add any theorems at all. If you match your preconditions to what your, pro what your implementation actually does, the proof gets easier. You match your post conditions also to what the implementation actually did. Um, so that's an easier way, often, to get to a proof than citing theorems. Sometimes citing a nice theorem gets you a long way, though. Um, there is one thing I want to finish up with, which is I want to come back to this picture. This is where we divided our game into turns. We divided the inside of our procedure from the outside of our procedure. So find what's coming inward, what's going outward. It's the quantification here. It's dividing the world into existential and universal. Um, and this picture is really what allows local reasoning. But it's also a bit misleading because this is the local picture. This is what happens when we are focused on just one procedure. And in the big picture, things look different. In the big picture, there are no demons. There are just a whole lot of bald guys, each trying to win their own game of necessity. And if throughout our program, we can arrange our games so that all the bald guys win their own game, nobody has to lose, and our programs can be correct. Uh, with that, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Ah, there we go. Uh, there's a plan for C++ 2029. What help do you need to make that happen? <laughs> a lot. Um, so, you know, oh, oh, the question is, if we want to get this for 2029, how much help do I need? The answer is a lot. Um, in particular, while programming is what I do for my day job, the amount of programming time and the amount of working with compilers skill that I have is very limited. <laughs> um, I would love it if somebody would implement some of this stuff. That would be so useful to me. I have hacky things of, on my own, but I, I 
haven't been, you know, I could, you know, with help, I feel like I could get so much further. I will say also, um, in addition to my compiler writing chops not being perfect, my management chops are even worse. So project management is hard for me. So if somebody wants to do that, even better. Um, uh, another question, yes. It's not a question, it's more of a topic area that I want some commentary on, which is contracts. Obviously seem to, to overlap with this space a bit. Do you have feelings about those? Uh, so the question, is, uh, well, the, the note is that contracts overlap with this area considerably. And the question is, do I have feelings about contracts? Uh, uh, about, I assume, contracts as they are going as, into yes. C++ 20? And the answer is yes. Um, next question. <laughs> How do you formalize the semantics of the inequality comparison? And you basically answered this by introducing a theorem that uh, allows to answer that. But what if you instead uh, ask the interface of the inequality comparator to uh, return a either a proof object that there is a natural number such that zero plus this number is n, or a proof object that the existence of this uh, number returns to addition? Basically, what depends on that theory? Ah, uh, so, so I'm not sure I can repeat that question in its entirety. Um, there's um, a suggestion that you could implement the interface of inequality or equality operators, I assume, um, by having them return proof objects um, proofs in this system are not objects. They are functions. They have a particular interface. Um, and so they're entities in the language. Um, you could conceivably return some sort of typed proof pointer that could point to any different um, implementation of the theorem, but the implementation of the theorem is just its proof. It doesn't matter very much which one you call. Um, so I'm not sure, I don't think that direction of going meta helps very much, um, but let's see if I have, oops, huh, I thought, oh, no, oh, I see. Um, okay, um, I don't actually have those slides here because there are slides that might explain further in tomorrow's talk and those slides are not in today's talk. Um, so I encourage you to come to tomorrow's talk and in tomorrow's talk, if all goes well, there will be actual implementations of short proofs. Um, it's mostly not about that, but I'm hoping to squeeze some in. Um, and if they don't manage to get squeezed in, then we can talk offline about the interface to the equality operator. But um, I will say that a possible talk for the future is going through actually full interfaces for all the arithmetic operations. Ah, yes. <coughs> Um, so the question is, uh, you know, here everything was integers. Integers are way easier than floating point. I will paraphrase. And floating point is hard. Um, I will say I do know one solid way to, ar to make arguments about floating point numbers. Um, which is it's possible to treat every fo floating point number as one of four different kinds of things. And this actually gets back to the mathematical definition of floating point numbers as cuts on rationals. That you can treat every floating point, or of, of real numbers as cuts on the rationals. Um, 
You can treat floating point numbers either as upper bounds to something that we know the true value is less. We can treat them as lower bounds, um, inner bounds, bounds towards zero or bounds away from zero. Um, and if you make that distinction, which is, you know, you could make different types of floating point numbers to make those distinctions, um, but they have some limitations on how they, on what operations you can do. You can add two upper bounds. You can subtract a lower bound from an upper bound. You can multiply two inner bounds, um, but you don't have the full suite across all the possibilities. But you do have the ones where you are making sure you get the bound in the right direction every time. If you do that, um, you can make some pretty strong arguments about floating point types, particularly if you're careful about the rounding direction in your processor. In practice, it appears to be utterly impractical to ever change the rounding um, direction in your processor for high-speed code. Um, so I am informed by people who understand floating point, the use of floating point numbers better than I do, that that is a terrible way to reason about how your floating point um, code works, and no one ever does that. But they have never fully explained to me how they do reason about their floating point code. Um, yes? that would probably enter the discussion better, mm -hmm. right? Because you usually don't care about the exact value of a floating point number. You care whether mm -hmm. it's greater or smaller than some other floating point number you also have, right? Yes, um, and that's, that's why the idea of directional bounds is so helpful, that um, your, the correctness of your program, if you are used to writing floating point code, will almost never rely on whether two floating point numbers are equal. In fact, for most floating point code, the correctness of your program in terms of do you have undefined behavior or not um, doesn't depend on the values at all because any two floating point numbers can be added together. You can divide any two floating point numbers. If you divide by zero, you just get a nan and that's fine. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, if you want to, to assert in your program that some value is not a NAN under some circumstances, then you need a little more reasoning. And I don't have, you know, I don't have great insight into it, but I observe that people can and do do that reasoning people successfully write floating point code. And I think that means they can write down their reasons. And if there is something wrong with the system I have here that keeps them from writing down those reasons, I want to know it, but I don't really have the tools to find it easily. Yes? Could you comment a little bit on the cost of actually running your game and proof? Is that complex and like, is it actually feasible to run for this medium sized program? Okay, so, okay, first off, uh, you know, you never run the game of proof. Um, running the game of truth is, of course, very easy. That's just, run, you know, that is very similar to, you know, that, that's just debugging tools. Um, you, can in, you can instrument the game of truth. Um, it's, you know, there are some rules in there that um, you know that we don't usually instrument right now, but um, that's fairly straightforward instrumentation. The game of necessity you can kind of run, and that's basically running your program symbolically. It's instead of having a value, you just say there's a name for the value, and you have tables of which values are substitutable and which L values are aliased for each other. And you can run that. Um, the only issue you're going to run into is loops. If you have a loop that goes on forever, your run can 
go, you know, that you can go on forever. Um, the trick to that is having judge is you have some judging algorithm for whether the players are are um, are playing the game, you know, are, are taking penalties. And if you adjust the delay of game rule so that instead of forever, instead of having to run forever to get a delay of game penalty, you have a rule that says when the judges get bored, you get the delay of game penalty. Now, there is some subtlety to what the best definition of judges get bored is, um, but I believe, it, but it's something you can do, and that's how you that that's how you check the game of necessity symbolically. Um, you say if the judges get bored on the turn of the guy with the horns, he's then you're in an inductive case, and you just push that through, and if the judges get get bored on the turn of the bald guy, then the bald guy loses. I wanted to mention that there's a partial implementation of the guy with the horns, and uh, it's called instrumentation guide or plugin. <laughs> that is a good point. The, the point is um, there is an implementation of the guy with the horns, which is called instrumentation guided fuzzing. Um, and in fact, um, that might be a more effective way to weed out bad programs than, than implementing the, the judges getting bored strategy that I described. Um, the judges getting bored strategy is how you actually pull the proof out of the program. Um, but the fuzzing strategy is well established and can really find things effectively despite not reaching quite the level of proof. Yes? I have another question regarding the feasibility of doing this. Isn't the branching also a problem? Like, because, because you have said you have symbolic execution, you can delay figuring out which value would cause a claim to fail at the point of the claim, but you have to decide at every branch already which way yes. to take. So um, you can get exponentially many branches you have to consider. Yes, um, the, the point here is that, yes, as an effective way to get the, to do this, playing through these games has the problem of having to branch, ha having to choose which way to go at branches and then come back and play the other branch, and that can lead to an exponential explosion. Fuzzing tools are a way to focus on interesting branches, um, but also the, the induction gets you out of the worst case of that, um, because branches that have already been decided, remember, are not really a problem. You know which way you're going to go. It's the branches that haven't been decided yet that multiply things out. And if those branches are in a loop, that's the deadly case. You know, having 10 branches so that it takes, you know, 1,024 cases, 1,024 cases is easy for a computer. A million cases is probably pretty easy for a computer. Um, it's the it's loops that run a long time without the judges getting bored is the hard one. And so what we need is A, to write our loops so that the inductions aren't, aren't incredibly complicated, um, and B, not let, let nest our loops 10 deep. <laughs> um, and of course, this is all local. If you want loops nested 10 deep, all you have to do is put it in a separate function. <laughs> um, so as long as you keep your neighborhood for a single procedure um, small enough, I think this can be very practical. Yes? So we have a framework here which you used to, <coughs> which can be used to prove programs on a quick translation unit table. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I'm running a program and I make a proof using this method, which is convenient because it's already procedural, so there I think 
for it. Um, is there any way for me to leave some kind of evidence that I've proved it, so that someone can verify my proof without having to reconstruct the entire proof myself? Otherwise, every single person which makes a modification following this methodology is going to have to redo the proof. So, um, the question is, um, is there some way to include in the program text, I assume, um, the notations that make this a proof so that other people can check it and can, uh, and can modify it if the, uh, you know, if the um, procedure changes? And the, and the answer is, the notations that make this a proof are part of the program. They're, they're in the executable code. Um, and if there is something tricky about how they will need to be modified if there are changes, we have comments for that. Um, but everything that needs to get checked should be right there in the code if we do this. And so all they have to do is modify that to, you know, they, under, they try to understand your code, come up with reasons in their head. The theorems that you call um, should help explain your reasoning. Your comments should help explain your reasoning. They basically ingest that and then modify the proof to match their changes, um, which may involve, if they do something complicated, calling a theorem that wasn't being called before. Um, but I think that, you know, with a bit of practice for how to read these, how to see the proof in the code, and a little practice writing proofs, and good nomenclature for the theorems, and that's, you know, mathematicians have terrible nomenclature for theorems. Um, we're going to have to work on that. Um, I think that with all of those things, this is a skill that we can teach people you know, you know, as easily as we teach programming. Yes? Um, is it possible to do, because uh, right now you're trying to do just like to prove like the correctness of the proof. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to do the reverse necessarily to take the program and mm -hmm. then generate these claims in the program so you can then see what things are actually being claimed, whether, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm doing, I'm doing something that's making a certain claim that I shouldn't be doing, or something like mm -hmm. that. Is that possible? So the, the question is, you know, I'm talking about um, writing a program, inserting claims and theorems and so forth into it. Um, is there a way to reverse that to take an existing program and find out what it is implicitly claiming? There's a little bit of that. If we write interfaces for all the operations, um, you know, part of that interface, for example, will be that there's a claim of can multiply on the star equal operator. And if that's part of the interface, these are absolutely checkable. We can turn on the instrumentation that checks that. And instead of getting undefined behavior because of the, because we have, you know, overflowed an int, we would instead get a simple assertion f failure uh, when you do that. And that we're already seeing the beginnings of today. Contracts should get us in that direction. But we haven't written contracts for any of the basic operations yet. And in fact, um, I think that there are some things that preclude using the existing contract system for the basic operations and for, well, really an awful lot of things. Um, but I think that, yes, once people have written interfaces for things, those are testable and they will help you debug your program. Yes? I think you people have written a lot of contracts. So, so yes. Um, Clang and I'm sure others um, has you know Clang has a tool UBSAN um, and there are other tools not associated with Clang but the Clang sanitizers actually check 
a ton of this stuff. Run the Clang sanitizers, absolutely. Um, run whatever sanitizers come with your implementation. Um, and that really helps a lot. It, it's true. It, does, it doesn't actually generate the claim statements, but it does tell you when you violate some important implicit claims. Yes? So how is this approach better than what's taken with like Cock or Hagda to where the compiler actually verifies your proof? Um, it seems like the human is still involved, involved in this particular approach. Uh, no. Um, so... I didn't talk about it um, because you know I'm not actually showing how in, in this lecture how the compiler verifies your proof. But that that answer I gave about the judging and you know judges getting bored and so forth, that's how compiler or an or a separate from the compiler tool can verify the proofs. Um, there is more to it. That's another lecture, but uh, but compilers verifying proofs is routinely is where I want to get with this.